thing virtually. You know, I'm sure that everybody's been doing webinars and trying to uh, make sure that everything's lined up for their work um, and make sure that you're networking and trying to get out there. Um, you know, really excited to be able to offer some tips and, you know, a few pointers, um, especially for those of you who are looking to change careers or looking to transition um, or who are, you know, in uh, the same job, but just kind of figuring out what to do moving forward. Um, you know, so to give everybody a little bit of a background on me, um, I had kind of an odd trajectory getting into this. Um, so I started as an academic and about, I'd say, you know, my third or fourth year into getting my doctorate at Texas a and I realized I did not want to go into academia. Uh, for those of you who are academics, hooray, um, charge forth. I hope that everything works well for you, but um, I had difficulty thinking through the market of um, going into academia and I just realized that I didn't want to have to deal with it, didn't want to do the job search, didn't want to have to move somewhere um, that, you know, Juneau, Alaska or Kansas or somewhere for a job and uproot my family. So that was really my first exposure to thinking through, okay, what does it take to change careers, right? Um, so I successfully did change careers out of academia, um, despite all of my professors basically telling me I shouldn't. Um, when I defended, all of them told me that I was making the wrong decision and that I needed to stay and I needed to publish and be a good little academic. Um, so for those of you who are in a similar position and you want to get out, stay strong. <laughs> um, you can do it. Um, so I started realizing that I had a lot of colleagues and friends who are who were in a similar position to me. They also wanted to get out and they didn't know how. So I found myself in the position to offer um, career advice to them. I started um, transitioning their CVs to resumes, um, which is one thing I'm gonna talk about, especially for people who are confused about the distinction between a CV or a resume. Um, this is really common, especially for international professionals. Um, to think about the distinction between those two. And it's a really important distinction. Um, but I started doing that. So converting CVs to resumes um, and started helping people get out and you know, find alternative careers um, successfully as consultants or um, in nonprofit positions or in higher education. Um, and I found that the most difficult thing was to think through how I explained thinking through what you knew as opposed to what you could do, right? So knowledge versus skills was one of the most important things that I talked about in my career coaching when I was first starting out, um, specifically with academics, but also with a lot of um, people even now, whenever I, I talk to people specifically who are in higher education or who are students who are entry level, who are looking to get into the workforce. Um, so yeah, I, I started off doing that. And then um, of course I was with the council, um, enjoyed being with the council for three years. I was their director of education um, and you know, nonprofit higher ed has been kind of my, my niche for the past four to five years, but I've been doing resume building, um, you know, LinkedIn, career coaching, things like that also. Um, but I just, once the pandemic started, I realized that it was a really great opportunity to help people and um, kind of launched my own business and brought all of the, the skills and the experience that I had to this business now. And now here I am uh, on a webinar with you guys <laughs> hanging out. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would really love to hear from you guys and, and hear about some of your questions, maybe some of your challenges that you're having. I don't know if any of you have um, questions about shifting careers. That seems to be one of the most common things, um, you know, right now, definitely to think through what does it take to shift careers? How do you represent that on a resume? How do you represent that in an interview? Um, these all can be really tricky, challenging things. Um, so if any of you have any questions, feel free to just do this or to put it in, um, 
the chat box. Um, other than that, I can always start on the distinction between a CV and a resume, which is, you know, kind of what I mentioned initially. Um, so for those of you who don't know, a CV uh, here in the States is generally something that is a very long, inclusive document. So whenever someone says, you know, give me your CV, generally it's someone who is an academic, um, not necessarily someone who's in the workforce. They can be used interchangeably, um, but it's kind of important to remember that a resume is generally a shorter document, no more than two pages, I would say, if you're at an executive level or if you're someone who um, is floating the line between an academic and a professional. For instance, I just um, worked with someone who was a faculty member um, who was an international um, person and who had worked in Germany and the States and Romania. And he actually had, he was wanting an American resume. So he had a CV that was 10 pages long. And he was like, Dr. Rika, can you help me <laughs> make this into an American resume? And so what I did was I, I kind of curated his content and made sure that it was industry specific for what he was looking for. Um, so, you know, we of course included his teaching, some of his publications, um, some details from his work experience, but his resume, when we got it down, it was three pages. So he was kind of an exception um, at the three page length, but generally we're gonna stick to one to two pages with a resume, a CV, you can go forever. <laughs> those, those things are, are super long because especially for academics, they're looking for as much content as possible. They wanna see all your publications. They wanna see all of your achievements, your awards, your grants. Um, so that's a really you know, good thing to keep in mind is sometimes in certain industries, they want this type of information. In other industries, they want that type of information. <laughs> So you really never know um, what, you know, what, what they're going to want unless you look at that job description and see exactly uh, what types of details they're looking for. Um, and that kind of leads me to how you curate information for your resume, right? So resumes are really tricky. They're a really, I don't know, they're kind of an odd document when you think about it, right? Because they're meant to get you in the door to an interview. To a job but it's just one page or two pages i mean how do you really explain yourself in that amount of space so whenever i talk about building resumes i use the word build for a reason instead of just write um, writing a resume you're putting content in you're saying all right i did this i did that but if you think of it as building a resume you are building an entire snapshot of yourself does that make sense? <laughs> um, so you're not just putting in what you've done. You're not just putting in, okay, I did this and this and this and this. You're putting in an entire, like I said, like a snapshot of who you are as a professional, what your proven results have been, what your accomplishments have been, and then basically what you can offer the company that you're applying for. So there's a certain way that you can frame the content that you have. And how I like to do this is by having specific templates and specific ways that I line up the information um, so that your key achievements and your skills and your most important accomplishments are up top rather than being at the bottom, right? So um, most of the time, whenever someone will come to me and ask about me having me look at their resume, I'll see work experience at the very top. Usually I'll see kind of a, um, like a summary at the top and then I'll see maybe education second and then work experience next and then maybe skills buried at the bottom. <laughs> you know, I can do Python or CAD or um, if you're in oil and gas, I can do Wellview or, you know, something like that. No, <laughs> don't do that. You're, uh, you're burying the lead. Um, so we want, hiring managers to see the meat up top, right? So we want them to see what you bring to the table as in your overview. So it is still important to have some kind of blurb up there. Um, you know, nothing too extensive, um, 
but something that gives a snapshot of your competencies of what you can do. And then you'd go into your skills, right? So bulleted skills, make it easy to read, fully functional, um, something that can be scanned, something that, you know, imagine you're a VP of a company and you get a document in your hand saying, you gotta look at this person. What would make it easiest for you to read that? Would it be block paragraphs, <laughs> right? It would be bulleted points, right? So that's why I always really hone in on kind of proven results, bulleted points, snapshots, um, is because that's the way that you're gonna catch the attention of a hiring manager. So you have those bulleted skills up top, you know, hard skills, soft skills, you know, put them together. If you're really excellent at communication, definitely mention that. Um, but don't put all soft skills, right? So a lot of soft skills like communication or teamwork or leadership, those can be, those are valuable, but they can be really vague and they can be something that anyone would put on their resume. So like I said, we want a snapshot of you. So that snapshot needs to make you unique right? Why do you stand out from other people? What makes you um, the candidate that they have to call in for an interview and hire? So it's important to highlight that your hard skills, skills as well. So if you're excellent at, you know, say you're in higher education, you're excellent at curriculum building. Um, what type of curriculum building, right? Are you really great at social studies curriculum building? Okay, make sure you have the specifics in there. Um, if you're really excellent at executive level communications, that's a good one to put in there. If you're good at consulting, what type of consulting? You see what I'm getting at? So you're, you're, you're including specifics that make you stand out to a hiring manager and that really show the value that you bring um, rather than only having, you know, a combination of, you know, soft skills that show why you would be a good fit probably for the culture but not necessarily a perfect fit for the job itself and the skills that are required. Um, so that's the skills section, <laughs> right? Next, you go to your accomplishment section. Okay, so we've had overview, we've got skills, and then we've got key accomplishments. Okay, so your key accomplishments, again, remember, if I'm a VP of a company and I'm reading this resume, am I gonna wanna read a paragraph of accomplishments? No, <laughs> I'm not gonna want to. Um, so how I usually frame this is no more than five lines, okay? So separated by, you know, I generally put it in 1.5 or, you know, at least, um, you know, kind of format so the, they're separated so that you know you can kind of get a sense of reading it easily. I bold certain portions or italicize certain portions so that it draws the eye to those accomplishments. And those accomplishments are really important. I mean, it's only four to five lines, but they are packed with data, okay? So for instance, if you're in oil and gas, say you're you know, a drilling engineer or something like that, and you worked with five high pressure, high temperature wells in the Permian Basin, <laughs> um, you know, for a multinational company. That's the kind of key achievement that I want to see as a VP, right? I want to see that you specialized in something that I care about. I care about high pressure, high temperature wells. That's a specialized skill. I care that you drilled to 15,000 feet. I care that you drilled in the Permian Basin. I care that you worked for a multinational company because that means that you can do foreign and domestic work, right? So those key achievements are really highlighting, they're giving that snapshot in a way that shows your full competency, not just, okay, I can do Microsoft Word, <laughs> right? But this is the value that I can bring to your company. Okay, this is what I've done in the past and this is what I can bring for you. So those key accomplishments, you know, like I said, probably no more than five lines um, that take up a pretty, you know, small amount of space. I always try to make sure, if possible, to have each of them be no longer than one line. 
Okay, so if you start going into second lines or third lines, uh, it starts to look a little messy. And again, people will lose interest. They won't read the whole thing and it'll just look too jumbled. So that's really why um, I always like to say that I, I build resumes, you know, because there's a lot of editing involved. Um, so I may have a whole blurb of information that I'm trying to cut down to one line. And that's really where, you know, it takes the time and the diligence on your part to think through, okay, what's the necessary information that I need to include in this blurb? If I were walking up to that VP and they asked me for an elevator pitch, you know, what do I do or what can I bring to the company? Then how would I give them five elevator pitches? Right? So that's kind of a, you know, a little snapshot of how I generally frame those three most important sections. And I see that we have a, a little question. Oh, pardon me. Okay. Okay, so a question about um, gaps in the resume. Yeah, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Um, so gaps in the resume. Um, okay, during interviews. So whenever we're addressing gaps in the resume, and this can be due to, to anything, right? This can be due to taking care of family or disability or you know, you had kids or something like that, you have a gap. It, it kind of, it is what it is. But when it comes down to interviewing, it's important to think of, again, not just what you did, but how you did it, right? So frame, be thinking about how you frame the skills that you used. So if you were a stay-at-home mom, what you juggled multiple schedules, right? You were you're basically a manager, right? Um, you, let's see what else. You um, maybe took care of administrative tasks for your family. Okay, so there are certain ways, and you know, I have all sorts of ways of, of spinning this on resumes, but there are certain things that you will want to leave in and certain things that you will want to leave out whenever you have a gap in your resume. Um, one thing that I always suggest to not necessarily include is a detailed explanation of the gap. Um, I like to kind of intersperse different things um, that show what I did to develop myself during that time or how I, you know, how. A, someone developed themselves during that time um, in the overview. Okay, so like I mentioned, the overview, the skills and the accomplishment sections. In that overview, I would mention at the very top, you know, somewhere in that small paragraph, um, something like, you know, enhanced um, management skills or administration skills, um, during a three three week period or three year period of um, remote working or something like that. Does that make sense? So you're framing it instead of saying I was with my kids <laughs> or I had a disability or I was taking care of my parents. I was working remotely. Um, what's also helpful, and I found this really really helpful for people um, who are looking to transition into different career paths as well is to frame any volunteering you did as a job in and of itself, okay? I used to do this all the time. Um, this is actually a big reason, you know, that I transitioned was because I hustled and I looked for remote work. Um, and so whenever I would pick up remote projects or remote work, I would use that, right? I mean, because I had a title whenever I was volunteering or doing that part-time. Um, so yeah, it went on the resume. So even if you were doing, you know, partial work, um, you know, part-time or if you were working remotely or something like that during that, what you might consider your gap, also think through including that. Um, you know, and I say that with a caveat, make sure that that work is relevant to what you're applying for, right? So if you're applying for, you know, a job in, in healthcare, and you were volunteering with a nonprofit, 
you know, weigh how important that information might be. If you are taking care of healthcare related tasks, you know, through that nonprofit, then absolutely include that. But always try to make sure that that information is relevant and timely for, you know, for your resume, for the job that you're applying for. This can be tricky. Yeah, that's it. Um, well, whenever you're um, finished through this, I just had a question about, you know, how you evaluate what skills you should be highlighting on your resume. Right. No, I mean, that's, that's good to go to, actually. Um, which skills? Okay, so I would actually answer that in two ways. <laughs> so um, the first way is we have to be considering the types of systems that are reading our resumes, right? I don't know how many of you have run into these electronic scanning systems or know of them. Um, but if you're applying to large companies, um, Fortune 500 companies or, um, you know, even some mid-level companies now use these, but there's scanning software that actually your resume will get put through. Um, and sometimes if you don't have, sorry, I've cat here. <laughs> um, if you don't have the right skills listed for the job description, tailored to the job description, your resume will get kicked out. Okay, so I'll go into that in more detail. That's the first portion, the scanning systems for skills. The second portion is it also needs to apply to whatever human being is reading your resume. <laughs> okay, so it's a balancing act. Um, it's a balancing act. Your template needs to be on point. It, it needs to be suitable for scanning systems and for a hiring manager to look at. Um, your content, your skills, all those things need to be applicable to both. Um, so yeah, so for the scanning software in particular, there are certain skills that you're going to want to hone in on based off of the job description. Okay, so for those of you who have any experience, you know, writing grants, um, I don't know how many of you have done that in the past, but they can be excruciating <laughs> because you have to look exactly at the description and then literally include all the information that is on there in your grant. And if you don't, you're not gonna get the grant, right? So it's very much a, okay, what are they looking for? Write down exactly what things and then make sure that's in, that's in your grant. Same thing with the resume. So picking up on your skills that are listed in the job description and not just under the area where it says qualifications required, right? Looking through the entire job description. Um, it's really helpful to make sure that you're picking up on keywords and putting those in a document. <laughs> okay, so what I, I mean, what I personally do is I actually take the entire job description and I create a word cloud. Um, has anyone ever created a word cloud before? No, they're pretty cool. So um, there are actually some websites like worditout.com um, where you can go in, you can take an entire block of text and just drop it in to um, their system and it'll give you a word cloud that shows you the most important terms from that, that block of text. I mean, and you can put in pages of text, it's crazy. You can put in a ton of text and it will spit back out the most important terms from all that content. So that way you're able to take that word cloud and say, okay, organization, technology, management, these were all the most mentioned words in, in this block of text. So that's going to give you a sense of what you need to do in order to create your resume. Okay, so whenever you do that, that's going to give you a sense of what skills you need to include. So if something like organization or, you know, executive management or consulting or something are all mentioned, then you need to make sure that those that's in your bulleted list. Um, it's also important to make sure that you're looking at entire descriptions of of the job and making sure that if your title is business development, for instance, that you're even including the term business development in your skills. <laughs> um, I know it may seem a little bit, you know, rudimentary to be doing it that way, but unfortunately, whenever we're dealing with this scanning software, 
you have to include as many terms as possible so that it'll pick it up. Um, because current resumes, recent resumes, don't include a summary section that say, you know, so-and-so looking for employment at blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right? um, your snapshot is, is much more, you know, senior operations specialist looking, you know, senior op operations specialist um, with 18 years in X industry. That's kind of more how you start your summary now for, for new resumes. <laughs> I know in the past how we all learned, even how, you know, forever ago when I taught it at a and I taught technical writing, and that's how the curriculum was telling me to teach it. <laughs> it was telling me to, to put in, you know, your goal. I was like, no, that doesn't seem like a good thing. So, <laughs> so things have shifted a bit. Um, all right. And then, yes, the second portion, you know, Basma was also making sure that it's readable to a human being. Right. So making sure that you're not making the resume so robotic looking, <laughs> you know, um, that it doesn't look like it's applicable for you know, it, like you don't stand out. Right. So it's a balancing act, you know, kind of like what I mentioned. It's a balancing act of including the right terms, the right phrases, um, but also making sure that you are highlighting your best qualities, your best proven results in um, in that, that top portion, especially because, you know, most of the time, once it gets to a human, you know, remember again, if you're that VP, you're only giving it 20 seconds tops. You have other things to do. You're on the phone, you're talking to your assistant, your kid is sick, right? Just, uh, just think like that VP um, and then curate your resume that way. Got it, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Yes, cover letters. All right, I have a question about cover letters. I actually just posted about cover letters today. <laughs> what did I say? Let's see. Um, okay, so cover letters are tricky because unlike resumes, they have to be, they have to encompass both the personal and the professional. Now I've seen cover letters that have gone a little too personal and just, you know, veer on the side of less personal if possible, right? You never want to give someone a reason to throw you out of the running because you shared too much information. So, um, you know, this, this also, you know, let's just be honest. I mean, there are times where people will think one thing if they hear that, you know, you're a parent or you're, you know, whatever. You know, we all know that people sometimes make assumptions based off what we say. So just be careful and kind of curate your information accordingly to make sure that you're not um, giving away too much information, but that you are letting them know a snapshot, again, a snapshot of your personality and your professional accomplishments. So, you know, like I mentioned um, today, I think I gave three steps to writing the perfect cover letter. And um, the first thing that you can do is to think through the length. Um, don't go over one page, never. Don't ever go over one page. Um, with your resume, it's a little bit different because your resume, if you're a 20 year veteran and you, know, you just have a lot of experience, then it's okay to go over because people are gonna be looking at that. They wanna see what things you did. But in a cover letter, people are a bit more hesitant to take the time to read it because you got to catch their attention, right? You got to convince them to read it and to figure out who you are as a candidate. Um, basically, you know, most people are only getting to the cover letter after the resume, right? To be honest, um, people are going to look at your resume first, see what you can bring to the table, be very direct, and then the cover letter should be the accompaniment to that. So this is why I say no more than one page. When you have one page, it really is all encompassing um, and it makes sure that you don't lose the attention of your reader, like with any document, um, you know, memo, email, same thing, right? You don't wanna lose the attention of your reader. So what I always suggest is a combination of three paragraphs, okay? So not including salutation, closing, 
all the little weird details up top where you include the company name and all that. Um, three paragraphs broken up, right? You don't want to have one giant paragraph or two giant paragraphs, three paragraphs, um, and include bullets. You can even include a quote or a testimonial from someone depending on your role especially for people at the executive level. I always suggest this because at that point you're trying to give um, an entire presence to what you bring, right? So you're not just, you know, you're not just someone who has experience, you are bringing an entire personality to this. And so giving someone, you know, kind of a snapshot of what that personality is and what you can offer is really a good thing. Um, so in the three paragraphs, you want to start out with, of course, your opening salutation, but this is where you're introducing yourself. Um, and sometimes it's kind of a silly, uh, silly example, but sometimes I like to describe this as you know, this, the three paragraphs as being like a love note that you give someone, um, you know, like when you're in middle school and you're trying to get them to, to respond back to you. Um, to answer you about going to the dance or something like that. You're, uh, you're trying to convince them that you're the person they want to go with, right? But not be too forceful, right? You don't want to scare them away. So you want to say, you know, I am a resourceful ex, you know, with a background in, right? So kind of leading into your core competencies, what you do well, um, and then what you've done, Right, so this is what I've done. This is what I bring to the table in the second paragraph. Here are my bulleted, you know, achievements or check marked achievements of some things that I've done. Again, that snapshot, right? At that point, honestly, after the first paragraph, people are like, okay, I'm, I'm bored of reading. I mean, people, especially now with screens in front of us all the time, as much as you can, just remember, they're gonna lose attention. So what can you do to keep their attention? And those bulleted, no more than three, you know, those bullets, those check marks. All right, cool. I'm still, in, I'm still reading. I'm still in the game. <laughs> okay. And then third paragraph, you're getting into why you love the company. You love the company so much. The company is the perfect company for you. And, you know, this job is the perfect fit for you. Um, you know, again, being mindful of your word choice, being mindful that you're not coming across as too personal, um, that you're not coming across as too needy, too desperate, <laughs> right? So again, keeping things professional, but showing your personal style and showing what you bring to the table. So um, that's really, I mean, in order to write the perfect cover letter, that is what works, I'd say, I mean, honestly, 95% of the time, un unless they're just not interested or they haven't read your cover letter. <laughs> um, that works almost every time because it stands out. Honestly, I mean, because most people don't write a cover letter that way. They write block paragraph, um, you know, this is what I do, this is how I do it. Um, but they don't really think about the love letter portion of, you know, you have to convince the company to like you um, you have to show the company why they should like you um, and then show them why they're perfect and why, why they're a great fit. Um, and again, if you can include any specifics, if you know someone at the company, name dropping is a good thing. Um, if you have worked with or networked with anyone that works with that company or something like that, um, I always say, a, you know, this isn't exactly on cover letters, but whatever your job searching in general, do informational interviews. I mean, talk to as many people as you possibly can. Just harass people. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like reach out, ask for five minutes of people's time because that means that your resume and cover letter has that much more of a chance of getting into someone's hands and getting you an interview. So, yeah. Okay, let's see, what else we got? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we got networking. Okay. Yeah, that goes with it. Okay. So, yeah. So networking, um, especially during COVID, especially during this pandemic, networking is one of the most important things you can do right now. 
Um, I'm going to give you a little tip <laughs> in terms of maximizing LinkedIn. Create a marketing campaign for yourself to reach out to people. So, you know, I always suggest this to people who are looking to shift careers, but it's important, especially right now, since we can't be in front of other human beings <laughs> other than through webinar. So it's really, really simple to create your own campaign. And all it takes is you creating a little template. Um, so a template that would fit into the, the message box when you connect with people, right? So instead of just hitting connect, you hit add note. Okay, have you guys seen that before? Like where you hit the add note portion? Okay, so I always suggest don't just connect with people, always add a note because that way people see that you are interested, they'll wanna follow up with you. Um, but it's important to think through what you wanna include in that note. So just like your cover letter, we're thinking snapshots, we're thinking direct, what is gonna be best for someone to hold their attention Okay, so I always say no more than three sentences. If you go longer than that, um, never go up front for the goods. <laughs> like, never go up front and just like demand what you're wanting or ask for what you're wanting. Really show that you care, that you're interested in connecting with this person. It takes more time, yes, but that's why you create the template, right? So you have the template and then you just cut and paste different sections to be meaningful for that person. Okay, so, you know, it's always important to think through, this is a tough time right now, so your introduction should always include something like, I really hope you're doing well during this challenging time, because you genuinely care, right? <laughs> you do actually care. I um, hope you and your family are doing well. Um, you know, I am X in X industry, I'd love to connect, you know, if you have five minutes this week or next, you can even include a time if you wanted to. Some people respond better to that. If you, you know, are not reaching out to a ton of people, otherwise you're going to get weird scheduling issues. But if you are saying, you know, I'd love to chat for five minutes if you have time, that shows that you're being respectful of their time. Um, would love to hear from you best, your name almost always you're going to get a response. I mean, I would say unless someone's really busy or they're just not on LinkedIn, 85% of the time, whenever you show interest, you ask for no more than five minutes of their time and you're short in your brief, people will respond. I mean, even if they respond to say, hey, you know, thanks for connecting, then that at least gives you an opening to be like, hey, you know, great to hear from you. Um, you know, would you happen to have time to chat next week? Something like that. So that's a really, really good way to broaden your network and to get you out there without necessarily having to go outside or um, take a whole bunch of time away. I mean, this is something that you can manage into your time. Um, and it, it really is smart to build in maybe, fi you know, 15 minute increments to do this or, you know, an hour at nighttime when you're sitting in front of the TV to do this. Because, you know, whenever you're just plugging and playing the template, you don't really have to think that much about it. And then you just wait for people to follow up. And then that gives you the chance to then schedule and talk to people. Um, one thing to remember about doing that, though, is that you'll go into LinkedIn jail if you do that too often. <laughs> so, so no more than, I think it's 95 invitations per day. Um, if you exceed that, then LinkedIn will put you in jail. And you can get out, I think, in a few days or something like that, but it freaks you out a little bit. So just so that you're aware, you're not like sending out 300 invitations every day and thinking that LinkedIn isn't going to notice. Uh, yeah, that's not. Yeah, uh, if I could just ask everyone to turn on their video and give me a smile, I'd love to take a screenshot for our Local to Global page. So I'll give everybody a few seconds. Thanks. Everyone's like, I haven't taken a shower yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>
Okay, continue. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so I mean, that's a really quick and easy way for you to connect with more people and make sure that you're not just going through this motion of like, okay, what do I do now? I don't know who to talk to. I don't know how to connect with people. Um, if you build in the time, you know, every day or every two days um, to do this, to do these little marketing campaigns, you'll build your network on LinkedIn. More people will follow your content if you give content and you'll have a lot more people you can talk to about whatever new industry you want to get into. Um, you know, I know a lot of people are looking to make dramatic changes right now. Um, some people are in higher ed and they want to get in the medical industry. You can't do that unless you network with people. Um, because, you know, it's not just about knowing the content. It's also about knowing the people. So um, that's a really fun, I, mean, I think it's fun. <laughs> it's kind of a fun and effective way to grow your network and to, um, to talk to new people. Cool. So let's see. Yeah, and jump on any webinars or networking events you can find too. Those are helpful. Webinars are especially helpful, um, but can be challenging, you know, for people if they don't have a large amount of time to block out. So the networking campaigns on LinkedIn are a bit easier and you can manage those on your own. Um, all right, new grads. Yes. <laughs> New grads, I have been talking to a lot of new grads. I've actually had a few as well who've lost their internships. I hope that that's none of you. Um, good, but um, I know that it's really challenging because a lot of companies have shut down their, their mentoring opportunities or are just scaling back on stuff. So, you know, new grads, you guys are in a unique position right now um, because you're actually in a space where you can, you have an in to talk to people and reach out when people are not in work all the time. Does that make sense? I mean, usually whenever you're trying to reach out, everybody's busy. They're all, you know, eight to five at their jobs. Right now, a lot of people aren't. So they have a lot more time on their hands to talk to you. So, you know, a good thing to do is, you know, in addition to doing the, the LinkedIn marketing campaigns is to think through, okay, how do I want people to see me? And one thing that I always suggest to new grads is to create a 30 second elevator pitch. Um, these are helpful for any type of, I mean, even if you're just talking to your grandma <laughs> and she's asking you like, so Johnny, like, what do you do now? It's important to have that 30 second elevator pitch of, this is what I do, this is how I do it, and this is who I hope, right? So creating that short little blurb, it, it helps you make so many connections with people because they know right off, all right, this is what they specialize in, this is what they're interested in. And even if you're a new grad and you're not fully sure what you wanna do yet, think about the things that you're driven to do, that you're most passionate about and frame your pitch around that, okay? So it doesn't have to be, I've done this, or I do that. It could be, I'm passionate about X, or I'm getting experience in Y, um, and I want to help, you know, this group of people or this industry. And that gives people an immediate, oh, cool, well, I do that. I can help you with blah, blah, blah. Here's my card. Um, but whenever you don't have that elevator pitch, or whenever you're just like, well, I'm going to school and I'm, I'm finishing and I'm not too sure what I'm going to do and I'm, they're gone, right? <laughs> um, pe people, people are gone, their minds are gone. So that can be a really, really easy and effective way for you to think through, okay, even if I'm just networking, because it's something you can even include in your emails, you can include it in your LinkedIn messages. You can include it in your phone calls for your informational interviews. You can include it in your interview if you get an interview <laughs> with someone because the first question, oh God, almost 85% of the time is gonna be, tell me about yourself. Well, the elevator pitch, that's telling someone about yourself. That's selling yourself right off the bat. Um, and it's something that we don't really think about all the time, right? I mean, we're thinking about stuff we do and we're kind of going through our day and, um, but whenever you have that pitch, 
it just draws people in and you'll get so many more people in your network just because they're like, oh yeah, well, I know someone who does that. They do that. Go talk to that person. And you start to brand yourself. And as a new grad, the earlier you can brand yourself, the better. Honestly, if you can brand yourself as someone who specializes in, you know, or you're, you're passionate about nonprofit um, management and you want to help, you know, I don't know, you know, organizations in Uganda, right? If that's your thing, if then just brand yourself that way. Make sure that people know you as the person who does this and people will come to you and they'll remember you because you had that pitch to them. Um, another thing that I always suggest to new grads um, is to create business cards. So I know that we're not necessarily in a space right now where we're going to use business cards, um, you know, face to face, but I create virtual business cards all the time and they're really helpful. So um, one software that you can use to create these is Canva and it's really easy. I'm pretty sure you can even use the free function on it to create a business card super user friendly they have tons of templates you can use and what you do is you just create your own business card again thinking through your elevator pitch right how do i want to present myself how do i want to brand myself um do i want when people talk to me that do they want to think that i'm zen well then maybe use soft blue do they do i want to think you know do i want them to think of me as you know a go-getter well then maybe i use navy or red or something like that, right? So think through your color choice too, because you want it to stand out and you want those colors to be representative of you as a professional and as a person. Um, so whenever you create your business card, you're able to actually save it and it's high quality. I mean, you can get super high quality resolution on that business card. And what I started doing was I would save it, I would send it to myself, and then I would have it as an image on my phone. So whenever anybody reached out to me or if I had friends I knew needed help with whatever, I would text them my business card and be like, hey, feel free to share my business card with anyone in your network who may be needing whatever, resumes or LinkedIn or whatever. This is a super easy way to broaden your reach too. Um, it's also something that you can include in a LinkedIn message, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's virtual and you look really professional only taking like an hour of your time to create a virtual business card. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then once all this pandemic stuff passes, just go to Vistaprint or, you know, wherever, you know, you choose to print things and actually have your business cards printed. Um, and a great thing about this is that you can actually change it or shift your title based off the type of reception you get from people. So if initially you have a title of yourself as, you know, nonprofit enthusiast or, you know, something big, um, and then you realize, okay, I've been sending this out a lot. I really like, you know, I'm getting a lot of weird, you know, or ambiguous, um, feedback from people. They're asking me a lot about what it means to be a nonprofit enthusiast. Okay, I probably need to change that title. Well, now I can just go into Canva and edit my title um, and then start sending out my new card, right? So having a virtual card allows you to actually have that flexibility um, to be able to make yourself however you want. Um, and then so that whenever we do all get to back to, you know, shaking hands and going to networking events, you can have a card that really works for you and that you vetted and that, you know, based off of informational interviews and responses from people and feedback, that's actually like, like it's solid, like people respond to you really well based off of it, you know, especially as a new grad, be very in tune to how people are responding to you. You know, don't take it personally, just let it roll off. You know, if you get responses that you're not expecting, that you're learning, that's okay. But really be responsive and really be in tune with how people, you know, the vibe that you're giving, you know, if you're like, oh, that was a little too forceful. Okay, maybe next time I'm, I'm going to pull back and I'll, I'll change my template <laughs> so, so that I, you know, I get better responses. Or, you know, and 
you can get a feel for this, you know, within a week or so, I'd say sometimes with even, a, you know, even a couple days, if you're getting responses from people that are not what you were expecting, you can be like, okay, maybe there's something about my template that's not giving the right impression. And then you can change it and shift it. So, you know, as a new grad, it's going to be important for you to be flexible and, you know, to be fluid and think through all that kind of stuff. Oh, what time is it? Okay. <laughs> Are we, do we have any time to answer? Another? We can take one more question. Okay, let's see. Ah, let's see. Hmm. Right. Okay, so I said a student who's struggling to find positions that match their major. Yeah, I mean, this can be really tricky. So, I mean, I was actually just chatting with someone yesterday about someone thinking that they wanted to be in finance and now they realize they actually want to be in business management. Um, if you're in this kind of position, you're actually in a good spot right now because a lot of people are transitioning and a lot of people are thinking through what types of skills and tasks they actually want to do. Um, so for instance, if you are someone who, I'll just use the example of finance. Um, if you're in finance and you're wanting to transition to something different, think about how different that's going to be, right? I mean, something like finance, that's fairly niche. And that actually is a really specialized skill, right? You're doing accounting, risk management, um, risk assessments. Um, you're doing a lot of account management with people. Um, so think through what types of things you like best about that. Okay, what types of skills you have that you actually like best. So maybe you really don't like the accounting part, but you really like the account management part. And you like working with people. Okay, you like account management. You're okay with doing risk assessments. Um, you're okay with working with senior level management. Okay, so maybe something that has to do more with people, you know, person to person would be a good fit for you. So think about all the skills that you have that would be good for interpersonal skills, right? And then consider what type of career might be a good fit. So something like business development, um, sales, is always a good one. I know sometimes scale, you know, sales scares people off, um, but there really is a lot to be said for someone who is a finance major going into technical sales um, or going into business management where you're doing business to business partnership building or even going into consulting. Um, it depends on what level you're at in your career, but a lot of people go into consulting and are really good at it because they're good people, people, <laughs> I mean, they're good with people. Um, you know, if you're good at managing budgets and cost controls and stuff like that, maybe working in operations, you know, there's all sorts of different ways that you can think through the skills you like best about what you do and then think about how those would transition to a different career path. So do a little research, um, and then, you know, make that list of your skills that you like best. Maybe plug in some of those skills into a search and see what comes up, right? You may be surprised to see what types of roles you could actually do. So, um, so thank you, everybody. This has been, you know, a blast. I wish that I could actually be in front of you and talk to you and meet you and shake your hand and all that. Um, I know that Basma is going to be sharing my information. So anybody that wants to connect with me um, on LinkedIn or email or anything, you know, feel free to. I'm always happy to answer questions and chat. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again. Like Amanda said, I'll share her information. Um, and hopefully we'll do this uh, in person. I know it was very useful for me. I hope it was for you as well. But um, thanks, and you guys uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Bye.